Good morning and welcome to First Lutheran Church where we gather to worship together as God's people. We come together to pray, to sing, to hear God's word, to confess our sins, and to eat a meal together on occasion. We are glad that you are joining us and hope that your life will be blessed by the time that you spend worshiping with us. If you would like myself, Pastor Naomi, or Pastor Jim to come to your home, to your apartment, to your room, please give the church office a call and we'll be more than happy to come and visit you. Thank you for being with us today and God's blessings. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. It is good to have all of you here on this bright, crisp and sunshiny fall morning where we come together to hear God's word, to pray, to sing and to eat a meal together. There are a number of announcements about our life together on your green sheet. Please take note of all of those. It is Second Harvest Week, so I would invite you, if you have not been a part of Second Harvest, to come on Thursday afternoon, anytime after 3 o'clock. We have things for everyone to do of every age and capability, and so do come as we um, support people in our community. If I recall correctly, the last two years, November was our biggest month, so we will need kind of all hands on deck for this week. Also, you will note that um, Jim's Bible study is continuing between services and on Wednesday mornings, and I have a study on Monday evenings at 6 o'clock on the Holy Spirit. We started last week, but you can jump in at any time and be a part of that conversation. Uh, A special announcement this morning by Peg. Good morning. I actually asked to speak this morning for a few minutes before worship begins about a ministry that is truly near and dear to my heart. It's a temporary shelter called Gifts. God is Faithful Temporary Shelter, a men's shelter that opened on Christmas Eve 2007. Kurt Nodolf has been instrumental for coordinating our participation over the last eight years. And I'm really pleased that Steve Schulte has recently made the commitment to work with Kurt to serve as one of our two congregational leaders, on-site supervisors frequently during the week, by far the most responsible and time-consuming roles that we are asked to fill. We are currently one of 32 Christian churches across the area that provide workers and meals for that shelter. In our case, we are not a host site. We partner with two other churches, and we are responsible for two weeks at a time, twice a year. In other words, we are responsible for a total of four weeks in a calendar year. Trinity Episcopal Church is the host site for us in our three-church partnership, and that actually creates substantial additional uh, time and energy on the part of the folks from Trinity simply because they are the host site, custodial duties and other things that come with hosting. I volunteered since this shelter opened, and I really have grown to appreciate the value of this ministry and the wisdom of the people who are in the leadership positions, because over time, the programming and the services have evolved. The men who stay at the shelter must abide by all the rules, and they work with counselors to find employment and a home of their own. And steady progress is expected. I come to you this morning because I recently learned that over the past year, we did not provide a third of the workers and meals during our assigned weeks, despite the fact that we are a much larger congregation than the other two churches with whom we partner. They have filled more shifts than we have. It weighs heavy on my heart, and I truly believe that we can do better than this. I also know that some of our most faithful workers have been serving gifts since it began in 2007, and they are ready to step aside. It is time for others to step up to the plate and get involved. Meal preparation and serving are often shared between households to make the workload more manageable. It's also more fun that way. Volunteers who spend the night find that coming with a friend often makes the time pass more quickly, so we find that Folks who stay with it are often doing that with their friends. I will tell you personally, Sue Johnson and I work the intake table once each week that we are scheduled simply to have time to see each other in our busy lives. 
so I'm up in front today asking you to prayerfully consider signing up for a weekly shift each of the four assigned weeks. The contact information for both Kurt and Steve can be found on the green sheet. Talk with your friends and your family and consider how participation could be a group event. Our first two-week shift begins the Sunday after Thanksgiving and ends December 6th. So the time is now to demonstrate that First Lutheran can be full partners in this ministry. I'll conclude by telling you that last summer my daughter and my two little grandkids came with me and we served an evening meal. The men staying at the shelter came out, offered to help us carry in the food and all the supplies from our van. They expressed gratitude for the meal and they couldn't have been more pleasant and respectful in their interactions with us. I've had people say, you brought little kids? And I say, yeah, the guys are great. I mean, they are really, truly grateful for those of us who come and provide for their needs. I know that God is truly present in that place each and every time I go. Thanks for listening this morning. Thank you, Peg, for bringing that in to our hearts, and I pray that the Spirit moves some of us to um, sign up for a shift or two. We surround two of our families in our midst with our prayers, the family of Elaine Casper, who lived here in Janesville until four months ago when she moved to uh, Texas to be with a daughter. Uh, her services were yesterday at Schneider Funeral Home. And we surround Pastor Jim and Sandy at the death of Sandy's father early yesterday morning, George Wilson. Uh, his services, there will be a, a brief service at Cedarcrest on Thursday at 2 o'clock at the chapel, and then next Saturday they will have the, the full family service in Independence, Iowa. It was a long journey, um, but you maintained humor through the midst of it and celebrated George's life, so we surround you at this time. With that, we begin our worship. We begin with confession and forgiveness. Would you please stand as you are able? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose name is majestic in all the earth, who rescues and heals in every time of trouble, who does all things well. Amen. Let us come before God seeking forgiveness and life. Steadfast and saving God, have mercy on us. We confess to you all the ways we turn from you and harm one another. In your compassion, forgive our sins and heal our hurts. Bring forth from us love and joy, gentleness and peacemaking, wisdom and justice, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the name of Jesus, the Son of God, receive mercy and find grace in your time of need. Your sins are forgiven. God's love is healing for all of your wounds. Rejoice, for God raises you up to a new life in Christ. Amen. Now thank we all our God.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Let us pray. O God, you reach out to us in mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace. Strengthen our trust in your promises. And bring all the world to share in the treasures that come through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. First reading is 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Go now to Seraphath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Seraphath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first make me a little cake of it, and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail, until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, Neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. 
Our psalm this morning is from Psalm 146. We'll read it responsively, and Pastor Naomi, Naomi will lead you in the response. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are the, they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps promises forever. Who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and the widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, through all generations. Hallelujah. Our second reading is Hebrews 9, verses 24 through 28. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is our reading. Our gospel for this 24th weekend in Pentecost comes from Mark, the 12th chapter, and I invite you to stand for the reading. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Now Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which are worth a penny. Then Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. As most of you know, I love to read, and I read a lot of stuff and read every day. I read a lot of novels. And the thing I like about reading the most is that I can put my own twist on the voices in the story. I can have them talk in loud voices or small voices, high-pitched or low-pitched. I can have them talk in any number of ways based upon how my imagination hears the story. In fact, this last week at our page turners, our book group here at church, uh, as we were talking about the book, one of the people said, I think I need to go read the story again. I didn't hear that person's voice that way at all. That's the beauty of sitting and talking about stories, is that you can discuss how a voice really may have sounded in the story. 
The reason I'm talking about that is because I think that we have often heard Jesus' voice when he is talking to the disciples about this widow who put her two coins into the coffers of the temple as, you should do this, kind of appointing a finger at the disciples, kind of that imperative. But today I'd like us to hear that voice just a little differently. I wonder if Jesus wasn't lamenting that this widow had put everything she had into the coffers. What if the voice was very truly, I tell you, she has put everything in there? And what if the point of the story isn't like what most of us probably have heard all our lives if we've been coming to church and heard this story. I can't tell you how many sermons I've heard that I have had this finger pointing at me saying, you should give your all into the offering plates. But I want to twist the story just a little bit because I think we forget about that first paragraph where Jesus is talking about the scribes. What if Jesus is talking to them, saying, you're not doing your job? For you see, it was the responsibility of the temple, of the community, to take care of widows and orphans. That was part of their job as a community. Make sure that they had what they needed to live. And the way Jesus describes the scribes in that first paragraph is, is that they're more concerned about how they look, keeping the temple up and looking great, how long their prayers were, rather than creating community and caring for the community. Now that's not to say to all of us that our offerings aren't important because they are. You come to this place every week and sometimes throughout the week the doors are open, the lights are on, the heat's on, and there's staff around. What you put into the offering plate takes care of all of that. It's important. What we do with our money is a matter of faith and it is our responsibility to create this community this place and take care of it. Here at First Lutheran this year, our budget is just a hair under $760,000. It takes all of us to meet that budget. About 68% of our budget goes to pay for staff. The rest of it goes to pay for this building and lawnmowers and computer systems and all kinds of things that it takes to keep this place going. Even though it's been increasing our per confirmation member, so each one of us individually gives about $288 a year. And that's been increasing over the last few years, for sure. But we are way behind the ELCA average, which, just a second, let me get the number, is $539 per confirmed member. We have a little ways to go. It's important what we do with our money because it creates community, creates a place where we can come and we can be together and then together we can care for the people in our communities. Now quite honestly, for most of us, money is an easy thing. It's easy to write out a check or add an extra $10 or $20 or $100 or $500. That's relatively easy for most of us. But as Peg said so beautifully this morning, what for most of us is the most difficult thing in our life is time. It's much easier for me to dig out my checkbook than it is to give another hour someplace. So maybe for us, our widow's might is our time. And there is no doubt that here in this place, we can't do what we do here 
as a community without all the volunteers who help weekly. The, they maintain the building. You maintain the grounds. You help in the office. You teach journey of faith, confirmation. You serve meals at funerals. Hundreds and hundreds of hours of volunteer time make what we do happen. But just imagine if we had a little more money and a little more time, what we could do in God's world around us. Talking about money is not easy. In fact, it's really uncomfortable. Talking about time is even more uncomfortable for me because quite honestly, I guard mine pretty carefully. But God calls us to be in the world and doing something in the world. Jesus doesn't warn us against money as an evil thing, only greed. That is the sin. Not having enough to do what we think we need to do. St. Augustine once said that God gives peop us people to love and things to use, and the sin is, in short, the confusion of those two things. God gives us people to love and things to use, and in short, sin is the confusion of the two. I think part of our difficulty in creating community is this. It's very easy to get caught up in the world and think that we, what we have is not good enough. Our media shows us that all the time, and it's very easy to go out and get the right pair of shoes, the right car. It's easy to do that because it's immediate and it's tangible. But what is difficult is creating relationship because it's intangible. What's difficult is creating community because it's intangible. It's one of those things where you say, I know it when I see it, but I don't know how to do it. And it takes time. It takes time. We are heading into that season of the year where we are heading into the holiday season, however you want to describe that. First with Thanksgiving, then Christmas, and then New Year's. It's a time when things are important in our world. But I'd like us to think about doing something this holiday season, starting today. Is every day, to, at the end of the day, or at some time during the day, when you get up in the morning, whatever time works for you, is to write down two or three blessings, two or three things you are thankful for. And think about how that will shape your life. I saw on Facebook this week somebody was taking a pumpkin, and rather than carving out a jack o' lantern this year, their family was every day writing blessings around the pumpkin and felt tip, Sharpie. It was beautiful. It was filling up, their pumpkin was filling up with words. What a great family practice to do. I think we forget sometimes to be thankful for what we have and to realize how much we have and how little some other people do have. God is inviting us to look at our community, to look and see Jesus' eyes looking back at us at those people who are lonely, abandoned, homeless, hungry, despairing, confused, jobless, those people whose families are crying in pain, those people whose lives are broken in so many ways, and we have something to give them. We have ourselves to share with them, not only personally, but as a community. God has called us all here in this time and this place and in this season together for a reason. And that is to touch the world. God cares about everyone. There is no doubt. 
God cares about the scribes, and God cares about the widow. God cares for all and invites us in to care with him. We have something to contribute. We all have been given gifts. We've all been given passions. We've all been given so much. And we've been given them because the world needs them. And God needs us to share them with the world. And maybe it's just a mite. Maybe it's just a little. But it will make a humongous difference in the world. Amen. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you please stand as you are able? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. United into one by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray for, with all of God's saints for healing, wholeness, and peace in all the earth. Eternal God, you watch over your people in every land and place. Give us all the gifts of compassion and grace as we embody your love. Hear us, O God. 
creative God, you made heaven and earth. Move us to delight in the earth and care for it as you desire. Bless farmers and gardeners as they rest from tilling the fields. And we pray for an abundant harvest. Hear us, O God. Merciful God, you execute justice for the oppressed. Glide global economic and financial leaders and all politicians. Embolden them to create financial policies that are just. Hear us, O God. Healing God, just as you set the prisoners free, liberate all who are bound by physical and mental change. Grant healing and wholeness to suffering communities, families, and individuals, especially Ron, Doris, Ruby, Edith, Diane, and Karen. Hear us, O God. Abundant God, you uphold the orphan and the widow. Provide homes and love for all who are alone, neglected or abandoned in our community. Open our hearts to care for you, all your people. Hear us, O God. Life-giving God, thank you for the gift of love. Bless Jenny and Aaron as they begin their married life and pour out your Holy Spirit of life and love on Adrian as he is baptized. Hear us, O God. God, your steadfast love is endless. Keep us faithful to you and teach us through the witness of your saints. Today, we especially remember George Wilson and Elaine Casper. Hear us, O God. Into your care, Alpha and Omega, we entrust all for whom we pray. Be with us now, always, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of that peace with one another today. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take a deed. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for everyone to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And together we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Please come. Everyone is invited to the table of the Lord. You may be seated.
please stand as you're able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those you have fed with this one heavenly food, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, keep you in his light, truth, and love now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.